Russell popularized his set theoretic paradox by substituting a relatable problem as follows. A male barber shaves all and only those men who do not shave themselves. Does he shave himself? Once again, we come down, this is a paradox, because basically the barber who shaves himself does not shave himself, and if he does not shave himself, then he shaves himself. You know, Russell's, technically his greatest paradox was, that's just the linguistic version of his paradox of, uh, of self-inclusion on sets, which is the set of all non-self-inclusive sets, or the set of all sets that do not include themselves as elements. He asked the question, well, does this set that I've just described, does it include itself or not? Right, does the set of all sets that do not include themselves as elements include itself or does it not? Well, if it does, then it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then it does. So you've got this terrible paradox. And the way he solved that paradox was using something called type theory, which is basically a linguistic stratification where you're not allowed to talk about it. If something might lead to a paradox, in other words, if you can actually combine a not functor with the idea of self-inclusion, then you're not allowed to talk about things on one level without rising to the next level. And you get this kind of idempotence thing going, and so you've got this infinite theory of types that just regresses up to infinity, right? Where you've got to, you know, every set, uh, you know, you've got unary sets, and then you've got uh, binary sets, two, two odd element sets, which consist of two one element sets. And then you've got, you know, you go up the number ladder this way, and you have sets of sets of sets of sets. And basically what type theory says is, well, this gets problematical when we use the not functor or the, or the not operator in logic, because then we can replicate Russell's paradox, so we can't actually use not in that way. Whenever we apply not, we've got to rise to the next level up, the next level of reference. And this separation of set theoretic discourse into levels is what allegedly resolves the paradox. The CTMU takes another way, it actually, you know, that's that's all very phony because in fact, reality uses self-inclusion all the time, you know, with not and without it. So type theory, in other words, uh, nature does not have to obey type theory. It laughs at type theory. You've got to have something that resolves the paradox on another level entirely. And of course the CTMU does that using the concept of self-duality or dual inclusion. You've got, on the one hand, got topological inclusion in which you know, a space or a, a point set contains smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller sets. And then you've got linguistic er, or descriptive inclusion in which an expression contains all of those that it implies, right? And those two forms of inclusion, actually, you can, they're oppositely directed. They actually work in a self-dual way so that every time you do that, in other words, sets contain, you can say that a set topologically contains its elements. But meanwhile, you can say that each element descriptively includes the set. And you can do that simply by imputing a certain syntax to the element, which is an operator, which is an identification operator that then identifies the set. This is how reality is built in the CTMU. It's built out of identification operators. So Russell's paradox cannot arise in any form that is not immediately resolved by the CTMU self-resolving paradox.